For there can be no denying that the Middle Ages were a difficult time to live. The Roman Empire, at its height, stretched from Spain to Syria and from modern England to Egypt, and everywhere in between the empire guarded vital trade routes that made food cheap and urbanization on a relatively large scale possible. As of 410, the city of Rome had a population as high as 800,000 people, fed by grain imports coming regularly from the Roman province of North Africa and Egypt. But then, Rome was sacked by Germanic barbarian tribes like the Visigoths, the Vandals, Scyrians, and Ostrogoths. Any urban centers in Western Europe, although these were fairly small anyway, collapsed with her and her provinces like Gaul and Britannia, overrun by yet more opportunistic barbarian tribes like the Franks in Gaul and the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes in Britannia. Tribes so successful, we know these provinces today as France and England. The Renaissance historian Leonardo Bruni demarcates periods of history according to the level of urban culture seen in Italy. Urban civic culture flourished during the Roman Empire and then collapsed with the Germanic migration, beginning in 410 with the Visigoths and ending in the 600s with the Lombards, another violent Germanic barbarian tribe so named for their long beards. Those trade routes take hundreds of years to emerge again, and when that urban civic culture begins to flourish, not only in Italy, but also across Europe, the modern world begins. We take our contemporary designations of ancient, medieval, and modern epochs from Bruni's History of the Florentine People, so it is worthwhile to read an excerpt. Bruni writes, at last, those Italian cities that had survived the various floods of barbarians began to grow and flourish and gradually regained their ancient prestige. In Tuscany, however, many cities and large and important towns had perished between the time of the first Roman wars and this new era. The medieval world developed as it did thanks in part to the economic deprivation and hardship that followed when Rome collapsed. Three systems arose in its place that helped the people of the Middle Ages survive. These systems correspond to the class system of the Middle Ages, made up of those who pray, those who fight, and those who work. Let's start with those who work and the economic system known as manorialism. So, when the Roman Empire collapsed, urban dwellers left what were once cities in the Roman Empire, where there was no food, and headed for the countryside in search of food, making arrangements with local landowners to work the fields in exchange for a percentage of the crops grown on that land or days of the week that they would have to work on that land owned by that local landowner. These manor houses had to be self-sufficient since those all-important trade networks had disappeared. So a manor might have a castle in its center, then a church, perhaps some defensive walls, artisan shops for producing tools or other needed items, forests to provide wild game for the nobility, and firewood for everyone to collect, housing for the peasants, and then the fields worked by those peasants. This is the beginning of serfdom, taken from the Latin word servus, servant or slave, through Middle French into serf. The arrangements made between lords and serfs were exceptionally ad hoc, so that they differed considerably across Europe, and were not quite so bad when the system originally started. If you had to choose between working the land of the local duke for three days each week and, or dying by starvation, serfdom sounds pretty reasonable. Serfs were not slaves, as the worldview of the Middle Ages was heavily influenced by the teachings of Christianity and the Roman Church, and it seemed characteristically unchristian to own another human being. But serfs were still tied to the land. Serfs couldn't be sold, but they could not leave the land upon which they were born unless the local landowner released them from their feudal dues. Good luck with that one. Serfdom certainly worsens as the Middle Ages progresses. Harvests increase and barbarian invasions decrease, and local landowners realize that they can make more money off of their estates by denying privileges to their serfs. The second major institution, though, is feudalism whereby a king would grant land to his vassal lords in exchange for their military support. Feudalism, like manorialism, is notoriously ad hoc and differ considerably across Europe. But the premise is the same. 
lengths of military service might differ. In France, for instance, it was 40 days a year, but the land was given out as a fief or a pledge that the vassal lords would come to the aid of their liege lord, the lord who had given that land to their vassals when that liege lord needed them. Feudalism begins in France and progresses under the famed Carolingian monarch Charlemagne. Charlemagne would summon his knights each spring, then decide where to campaign, and thanks to Charlemagne's military brilliance, they would conquer new land that Charlemagne used to reward his military supporters. The Franks under Charlemagne carved out an empire that would include modern-day France, Germany, the Low Countries, most of Italy, Poland, and Austria. Charlemagne's military successes enabled him to turn his fabled court at Aachen in modern-day Belgium into a center of scholarship and learning that Europe had not seen since the days of the Caesars. Feudalism, subsequently, is perfected during the age of the Viking invasions, when European society militarizes itself to provide a defense against those bands of Scandinavian raiders who could strike practically anywhere they wanted to. Kings and local lords spent any available funds recruiting and training knights for defense against the Vikings. Now, to help encourage knights to use their weapons and training for defense and not for intimidating the peasants, which happened all too often anyway, the warrior elite developed and then celebrated what was called the chivalric code. Chivalry, so often associated with knights and feudalism, is the code of conduct meant to guide knights on and off the battlefield. Chivalry comes from the French word chevalier, or horse cavalry, and as such, the chivalric code is meant to guide the conduct of the warrior aristocracy, the only individuals who could afford to maintain a horse. Chivalry, as an ideal to which all knights should aspire, was celebrated in the great medieval romances, songs composed and recited in the banquet halls of great kings. Works like the Arthurian legends and the Song of Roland, which actually depicts a military failure of Charlemagne when his forces were ambushed in the Pyrenees Mountains, well, these, uh, these works depicted knights fighting with unparalleled valor on the battlefield. As demonstrated by these great medieval romances, knights should balance their martial prowess with loyal service to their kings, fighting to defend the poor from enemy attacks, and as always, courteous attention paid to all the great ladies of the realm. And the last major institution of the Middle Ages is monasticism. Monasteries were communities of Christians who had effectively removed themselves from the world and taken vows of poverty and obedience so that they could live special lives of devotion worthy unto God. Monasticism has its roots in the ancient Roman Empire, when Christians would remove themselves from large cities that they felt impeded their ability to live out an authentic Christian lifestyle. These figures would then spend the rest of their lives fasting and praying in deserts or secluded mountainsides. And the ironic thing is, while these monks left cities to be alone, indeed the, work monk, the word monk comes from the Greek monakos, one who lives alone, people started following them out into the wilderness so that they could imitate their unique brand of holiness. Monasteries were often founded by members of the old Roman aristocracy, who converted their family homes into monastic communities and allowed other monks to live with them. The most famous of these monasteries were those founded by St. Benedict of Nursia. St. Benedict adopted the highly regimented Benedictine rule that made the lives of monks centered on prayer, Bible reading, and difficult manual labor. This manual labor would be mostly farm work, but would also include, whenever possible since this was so expensive, copying manuscripts of the Bible and of significant Christian texts. In the Middle Ages, monasteries were some of the only institutions that offered a sense of community, a consistent supply of food, even if it was simple and plain, and the surest location in which you could get an education. Moreover, the monastic lifestyle was meant to be hard, so monks were prepared physically and emotionally for the tumult that engulfed the rest of Europe in the Middle Ages. Monasteries and the monks who lived there were often the primary vehicle for extending not only Christianity, but also whatever remnants of Roman civilization that the Church of Rome had preserved into areas overrun by various barbarian tribes. But 
the success of monasteries would ultimately be their undoing. The warrior nobility of Europe often endowed the local monastery with lands or some sort of financial endowment with the hope that the monks at that monastery would be praying for the warrior nobility and the salvation of their souls. In time, monasteries would become extremely wealthy institutions in their own right, and this wealth often undermined the kind of piety that monks should have been pursuing. On top of this, Vikings, those raiders from Scandinavia, loved plundering monasteries, since monasteries were wealthy and the monks who populated them were ultimately defenseless. And if you're a raider, you probably want to raid people who are least likely to fight back. Still, monasteries became centers of scholarship in the, in the Middle Ages, and great monarchs like Charlemagne, in a program now called the Carolingian Renaissance, would sponsor efforts to copy down great manuscripts from the ancient world so that they would be preserved for the next generation. The only reason we have the books from the ancient world we do is that a monk somewhere in Western Europe copied it down at great physical cost to them. One scribe writes, The art of scribes is the hardest of all arts. It is difficult toil. It is hard to bend the neck and plow through the pages for three hours. Three fingers write, but the whole body toils. Just as it is sweet for the sailor to reach harbor, so sweet is it for the writer to put the final letter on the page.